Courtney had posted, yeah, something about wanting more days like this. And it was just this awesome picture of her on the beach. This picture sparked a decision to save a life and connected two women who understand just how difficult life can be living with a rare kidney disease. Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome to the Morning Medical Update. The National Kidney Foundation reports that right now more than 100,000 people need a kidney donor. On average, most people wait about three to five years to find a match. Today, we hear one woman's journey to find a new kidney and a new friendship. But first, let's get to our morning rounds. Today is National Wear Red Day, a chance to stop and think about our heart health. Heart disease remains the number one cause of death in the United States. And this year, one of our doctors has been chosen by the American Heart Association to be what's called a real woman survivor. Neurologist Dr. Deepika Agarwal is in the back left of these photos. Uh, this was an event that took part in New York City this past week, and that is where she is joining us live this morning. Doctor, how are you? Good, uh, Jessica. Good morning, and thank you for having me here. So, Dr. Agarwal, you were on our program before. You're a cancer survivor and now a stroke survivor. How did you learn that you received this distinction as a real woman survivor? So, yes. So, every year, uh, the American Heart Association's uh, Go Red for Women chapter uh, selects a group of uh, national volunteers or also called as a uh, class of survivors that comprises of uh, 12 women who are uh, uh, heart or uh, stroke uh, survivors and are passionately involved in speaking publicly and sharing their stories through social media or uh, within their own community uh, and help uh, in raising awareness and motivate uh, others uh, to learn the learn and understand uh, the signs and symptoms of uh, heart disease and stroke. So, doctor, it's not lost on us that you're a neurologist and, and you have a stroke. And when some people think stroke, they of course think the brain. But can you help connect the dots between heart health and a stroke? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, both heart health and uh, strokes are very closely related. So for example, the most common uh, cardiovascular uh, disease is hypertension or high blood pressure. And high blood pressure is the cause of more than half of the strokes. And then the other one, like uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, people with atrial fibrillation or uh, irregular heartbeat, their risk for stroke is five times higher than uh, the the, uh, the other people. So, I mean, cardiovascular disease and uh, strokes are really very closely uh, related. So what's your message to other stroke survivors out there? Yes, so I have actually two messages for uh, the other stroke survivors. The first one is regarding uh, the stroke recovery. So usually I've seen uh, people uh, having a misunderstanding that stroke recovery uh, happens only for a year or so after your stroke. No, that is incorrect. So time and again, uh, research has shown and proved that uh, our brain tissue or the neurons, they can regenerate timelessly. So stroke recovery comes with no expiration date. Keep doing your therapies and exercises. Like I am more than four years uh, post-stroke and I'm still doing my uh, physical therapy, my occupational therapy, and I'm noticing benefit. And the second message I have uh, for all the stroke survivors, that is uh, a personal uh, close to heart message, that depression is a common experience for stroke survivors. Uh, more than one third or almost half of the stroke survivors are uh, prone for uh, mental health uh, disorders like depression or anxiety. And it is caused by a biochemical or a neuro neurotransmitter change in the brain. And then depression can also be the normal psychological 
reaction to the losses caused from the stroke. So if you are having symptoms uh, suggestive of depression, like feeling anxious or sad, a feeling restless or hopeless or loss of interest uh, in activities, please ask for help. Talk to your physician, talk to your uh, therapist, practice uh, meditation, mindfulness, because depression uh, may not only uh, uh, make your recovery or rehabilitation process uh, more challenging, but uh, it would also affect the quality of life. Dr. Agarwal, I really appreciate you bringing that up and sharing that and being so candid. It's really, really important. Uh, you're a doctor, a patient, now you're an advocate. We uh, just want you to keep up the great work and enjoy, enjoy New York City. Thank you. Well deserved, thank you. Well, five years ago, Courtney Walker's kidneys were only functioning at about 37%. She needed a kidney. Well, she found one and a new mission with the help of her donor and this guy. I just hope the rest of the team is not upset with me. Hey, doing the right thing is never the wrong thing. It's the words of wisdom that we have come to know and love from Coach Ted Lasso and what helps bond these two women for life. Hey, but taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse, isn't it? If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. Same goes for standing on your head. And I posted a picture of me doing a headstand, and that's one of my favorite things to do. You can't think when you're upside down. And I put that on a post, and I said, I want more days like this. I don't know what, what it was, but it hit me, and I was like I need to call and just see if I could be a match. And with that, a plan was in motion for Gina to donate her kidney to her new friend, Courtney. My kidney doctor told me in 2021 that I was going to need a kidney. Courtney and Gina met at a national conference for IgA nephropathy, a disease that causes a buildup of proteins in the kidneys. My best hope of survival was not doing dialysis, but to find a living kidney donor. So at that point, I started doing everything I could to be the best patient and the best advocate for myself. Turns out Courtney and Gina's daughter have the same kidney disease. So the two struck up a friendship through texts and social media. I remember in April getting a call that said like everything from that two days of testing looked great. It looked like we were a match. I'm just amazed at her generosity and her heart and her spirit. Love you. I am just excited, yeah. I get a lot of questions. Are you nervous? Are you scared? And I'm not at all, which tells me that I'm exactly where I need to be. And with both out of surgery and doing well, these two are just getting started. This is our campaign that we want to make sure that people start making those phone calls. With inspiration from their favorite coach. Belief doesn't just happen because you hang something up on a wall. All right? comes from in here. They plan to take their message to the masses, spread the word, and make others believe. I just feel like I have a partner. She's my donor, but like we have work to do. I just am so grateful that we get to do this together in the future. And Courtney and Gina are here with us in studio this morning alongside their doctors, Dr. Tim Schmidt and Sean Coomer. They're both transplant surgeons who took care of these ladies. Dr. Schmidt is also the director of transplantation here at the health system. And Dr. Coomer is our vice president of perioperative services. Glad to have all four of you here. How are you? Good, doing good. Good, good. To, good to see these ladies absolutely. upright and doing absolutely. well. Absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Schmidt, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. They're, they all, they look too healthy to, be our patients with the, the I know, no, right? It's always <laughs> nice to see them on the other side. So uh, just so glad to, to have you here to share more about your story. And, and Courtney, I want to start with you. The transplant I was back in August. Mm -hmm. I remember coming to your home the night before the yeah. big day. So that was a really fun experience for me just to see and, and talk with you. I loved that. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling really good. The first couple months after transplant is trying to find the right perfect chemical mixture of anti-rejection medicines, but on the up and up, you is, know. Dr. Coomer, is that pretty typical because 
um, you know, we talk about how the people feel g good instantly with a kidney transplant. Is, is that pretty typical, though? Do sometimes people have to kind of find their way a little bit? It is, yeah. The medi medications are very complicated. They're new. Um, everybody metabolizes them differently. So finding the balance is, is really key. And they're, they're miracle drugs, but they also can harm the kidney as well. So you just have to find that perfect balance. Yeah, the balance, that's the word. So instead of waiting on the list for a deceased donor, you, you chose to go out in search of your, of your own donor, which people are doing. They don't. They don't want to wait. And what made you decide to go that route? Um, well, as I had my nephrologist and was working with him, I hated the idea of dialysis, and there was no way around that without proactively pursuing a preemptive transplant, a living donation. And I knew that by sharing my story, asking others to share my story that it, someone would listen, mm -hmm. someone would read it, someone would realize, someone would pass it along to the right person, and the right person at the right time actually read it. She, it. it just like it came, it came into focus. Uh, before we jump into this, this special relationship, uh, Dr. Schmidt, you're, you have to share the bad news. Explain dialysis. Well, why is that just a place nobody, a road no one <clears throat> wants to go down? I just thought about it just in a different way. You know, she was on the uh, the beach the other day and taking a vacation with dialysis is the challenge. I mean, probably impossible since you're tied to a chair every other day, three days a week. And so it's uh, lifestyle limiting. It wears you out because it drains your energy and drains your fluids and then you feel bad for another day and then the next day you go back to dialysis. It's damaging to your uh, blood vessels, can cause uh, hardening of the arteries quicker than normal and it's just very uh, depressing as well from a mental health standpoint so from a physical mental and uh, you know physiologic standpoint it's a terrible process for people have to go through yeah, to, avoid no. it, to avoid it would be great right yeah it's an ugly process as, as we hear these stories again and again so Gina your daughter Addison uh, has the same kidney disease as Courtney and she may need a transplant one day you, you just don't know but I, I want to share something that your daughter said about your decision to become Courtney's donor I just felt really happy knowing that there are people out there like who would be willing to do something like that for someone who has the same disease that I do is amazing. I don't need it right now. And even when I do, what if you can't donate then? Then that's just a kidney wasted basically. <laughs> Well, and you had said that. You said, Courtney needs it now. And you said, hopefully somebody down the road, if your daughter needs one, will be that person that yes. you are for Courtney. Um, what's it like just yes. seeing your daughter? I know she's gone through so many health issues, but just to seeing her stand there and support you the way she is. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be sitting here and would have, I wouldn't have donated if I hadn't had her uh, support and her approval, I think, to move forward to do this. Um, she's just... She's everything. She, show, she has so much maturity and love for advocacy. And so um, it's our mission now to take this forward. So if it comes to a point where she does need a kidney, we've got her. You've got <laughs> so her. You've got her. Well, got you're starting team. now to get the word out so yeah. that when she does, if she does, um, yeah. the, the right person is there to pick up the phone. But you mentioned the Facebook post that uh, convinced you to yes. donate, uh, just the selfless decision. and. Um, you know, I, I ask you why, but you just kind of said there really was no question. It just kind of came to you. You had met Courtney, but when you saw this, it was like, wait, what am I doing? Yeah, yes. I, I honestly, I can't explain it. I feel like it just fell in my lap and it was, this is what I have to do. This is what I want to do. It just had this really strong desire and there was no second guessing it. There wasn't a lot of thought really put into it or researching anything. I just knew I was meant to do this. And so... I, literally within probably 10 minutes of seeing that post, I looked up the number and called KU and said, what do I need to do? So, so Dr. Coomer, what is IGA nephropathy? Um, I know I have to bring you in to talk about, they get to talk about the, yeah, <laughs> the fun well, yeah. stuff, the fun and stuff, you have to bring yeah. in and talk about this stuff that yeah. we don't like, but what is, it, what is this disease and what is the effect on the kidneys? Sure, IGA nephropathy, it's, it's not an acquired disease. It's, it's bad luck. 
and it's not immune disease and the IgA which is an antibody basically gets lodged in the kidney and sets off a cascade activating the complement system in the kidney which causes some leakness of, and inflammation of the kidney and damages it. So one of the signs or symptoms is protein in the urine but really that's just the sequelae of the damage that's going on in the kidney. So her kidneys were functioning at like 37%. So what does that level mean and that failure mean to the body? So, you know, when you think about that, so I, I always tell folks, you know, when, when people get a kidney, they all of a sudden they feel, wow, I'm, I feel energized. Mm -hmm. Um, the people, when they get kidney disease, slowly go down. So they don't realize how really mm -hmm. tired they're getting. Um, so when they get their kidney, it's, they're, they're going to snap up right away. Now, the recipient, the, the recipient feels that way. The donor doesn't <laughs> feel that way. They immediately lose half of their, their kidney mass, and they're like, wow, I'm really tired. So they almost feel a little bit of kidney disease. Uh, as, so it's pretty unique uh, kind of situation. But nonetheless, it's... Um, you're just really tired and a malaise, and really people qualify for a deceased uh, donor kidney when they hit a 20% mark, if you will. So this was 37, so there. it's preemptive. Yeah, getting there. So Courtney, tell us what a bad day felt like before the <clears throat> transplant. A bad day felt like you have a horrible hangover, but you didn't drink. Bummer. And yeah. you are nauseous, yeah. fatigued, kind of icky feeling. Um, like you just want to stay in bed and rest. You want to drink a lot of fluids. It's 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 like a hangover without the enjoyment of having the liquor, having a cocktail. <laughs> I know. As, as I said, that's kind of a bummer. So, but was it continual, or would you kind of go in waves, or did you get to a point before transplant that it was getting just getting more? And more? Well, the nine months prior to transplant, I had um, a repeated infections and I also have Crohn's disease which made the whole situation a little bit more complex and um, so we didn't know when the Crohn's disease was acting in and mm -hmm. the eye gan or which was it together but um, fatigue nausea um, and I say fatigue and that doesn't explain it it's like I'm so tired I've been carrying a hundred pounds of luggage mm -hmm. all day every day and now and I can't put it down you just have to keep carrying it. So, um, never ending. Yeah, you have to cancel on things that you don't want to cancel. You have to miss birthdays or celebrations because you literally are too tired to attend. It's the energy to get ready for the party. It, is just, it wipes more you out. Than the, yeah. So, Dr. Schmidt, I want to bring you back in here. I, I know transplant, kidney transplants keep you very busy. How many transplants are we doing here at the health system, uh, you know, annually? Kind of put some numbers with it. How many are deceased? How many are living? Uh, last year we did almost 200 kidney transplants and about 50 of them were living donors. Um, and uh, we've been doing that number for the last three or four years. Uh, January was a really busy month. We did 10 liver transplants, 20 kidney transplants, and four heart transplants, along with all the other general surgery we do. So January uh, 2024 started out to be a really good month to help a lot of people in need. Uh, so I think our numbers continue to increase steadily over time. And we love this behind the scenes video that we get to show you and Dr. Coomer at work side by side in operating rooms. You need two operating rooms when this uh, living donation is going on. Uh, tell us kind of, I always to call it like the dance. You and Dr. Coomer, you guys are kind of going back and forth and talking and, and you know, talking about the kidney and when it's coming out and getting it ready. Tell us what it's like. I mean, it's really kind of a good uh, coordinated dance routine now maybe we're like the boy bands of kidney transplant or something but he, uh, <laughs> he he starts the case with the kidney and I make sure everything is going well for uh, the donation before we bring our patient back and then we get our patient back get the uh, site ready for implantation of the kidney and then I go to the room with uh, where he's taking the kidney out and he takes the kidney out basically hands it over to me we flush it to make it cool down and shut down all the metabolism and then prepare it for implantation and then go to the other room and sew it in. And it's really neat because sometimes a kidney will make urine right on the field and it's uh, one of my favorite cases to do because you can see immediate function and 
it's a, a, a fascinating thing that the kidney just wakes right back up. Yeah, I love it when you tell that story. Not something we think about at the minute you see urine squirt out. <laughs> you have to, I guess there's no other way to really describe it. So you're in love. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's it's it's just very very cool, uh, Dr. Schmidt. I know you have to go. Just really quick before we let you go, just what's the takeaway? I mean, we know um, this, we see stories like this, a match, finding finding the right person. Um, what do you want folks to know? I just think that the kidney donation is a fantastic gift, and there are people out there that need a kidney. As you said earlier, there are 100,000 people on a kidney transplant waiting list, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't make it to the transplant. So if you have that in you to donate, um, uh, that is a gift that will give somebody life. And if you listen to uh, the patients who receive kidneys, it's a fantastic gift. And your life after donation is just as long and the likelihood of dialysis is almost the same as a normal patient. So I think there's low risk and the reward is fantastic. All right, well, we'll let you go. Get back out there, do it again. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I know you got to do the same, but I'm not letting you go just I yet. Know, I know. Just really quick, though, <laughs> explain to people the difference between the deceased and the living donor, and just kind of what do you make of, of people kind of saying, I don't want to wait on the list anymore for the deceased donor. I, I want to go find my own. Yeah, it really depends. Across the country, it's different. Mm -hmm. So there are some places across the country where people are waiting 10, 15 years for a kidney while on dialysis. Uh, we're, we're a little bit um, more, you know, we, we're more gifting here, more mm -hmm. donation here. So the wait is still three, five years, though, mm -hmm. for a deceased donor and kidney, and it's not elective. You might get called at three in the morning and say, hey, come on in. We got to get this done here in the next few hours. And uh, so where this is actually planned with a living yeah. donation, uh, everything, we optimize everyone before they show up, um, and then we pick a date. And then it fits everybody. And then all of a sudden, like, that's the day I'm off dialysis or preventing dialysis, or that's the day my life changes. Yeah, so. yeah. And you always say, I love it, your story. You have the job in this hospital with the biggest pressure because you have to cut open a perfectly healthy person because Gina has gone <laughs> through the ringer. She's, she's at the <laughs> utmost optimum health she can be um, to be able to donate. So, so what's that like? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the things they, you know, the teaching in medical school is, you know, first do no harm. Well, this is, <laughs> we're doing harm, yeah. right? It's, it's counterintuitive and you're operating somebody that doesn't need an operation. Uh, everybody getting an operation here at this system or anywhere else is hoping to be better on the other side. Mm -hmm. And we hope that we keep that donor the same. We're not gonna make them better. And God forbid, don't wanna make them worse. So it is, it is truly a risk and it's uh, a truly a, a tremendous gift uh, that that donor goes through. You said, Courtney, that you felt a little guilt through this process receiving this this gift. Yeah. Uh, do you still feel that way? Um, actually, as going through this process, one day, and I know we were talking about this prior to transplant. One day, I just felt it in my heart that that's where my kid, that her kidney was supposed to be inside me, as an instrument to do good and pay it forward, and that's exactly why we're here together and why it's just the right kidney in me. It worked out. Well, and I had mentioned in the piece, it was like, that was a big day, but you got a lot of big days coming up where you two mm -hmm. plan to get out there and, and really shout at the, at the mountaintop and, and get your message out there. What are you both doing or what do you plan to do? Well, we've been, um, I've been speaking on patient panels um, and this year now that I'm recovering and getting to the six month point. Um, we have some opportunities this spring, a couple in Nebraska, a couple here in Kansas City. Um, later in the spring, we have an opportunity in San Antonio to speak, but the sky's the limit. We want to take this message and make sure that people share other people's needs, share other people's stories, hopefully to raise awareness and to make sure that someone just answers, picks up the phone and makes the call just to find out if they should even get the blood test. So, so, so you, go ahead, Gina. I was just gonna say, I think another big piece of it is just like educating any chance I can. I mean, just those personal conversations and, you know, sharing Facebook posts and um, yeah, just, just a lot of little things oh, too. There's so many yeah. different avenues to reach people now. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's good. And you both have found a lot of inspiration mm -hmm. as all of us have through Ted Lasso. What is it about that character that has really spoken to you both? Oh gosh, 
everything start. about it. <laughs> I think I think just the whole show just shows so much empathy and compassion, and um, it's just such an inspiration. One of the the quotes that was meaningful to us or to me anyway through this process um, was, "If you care about someone and you got a little love in your heart, there ain't nothing you can't get through together." And that's just been kind of. Yeah, overriding. Just, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how you can't watch that show and just feel good. And not feel so. the feels, and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and for me, that the very first episode, they put up this sign, Believe. And it's everything that is around that, that, like I, I want to say today, every single person in this building, in this hospital, was responsible for our success. It was a team. It was the fourth floor bell transplant team. It was all of you guys. It was Gina at the very front desk at the very opening of the hospital. Mm -hmm. It was everybody that on fourth floor that was taken by this infectious believe and stay curious and open. And as a team, we could do anything. So we, one ginormous like Ted Lasso locker room, yeah. pump up. We, we made were, this whole place it, Ted Lasso locker room. I love so. it. I, the best part <laughs> We're not was. stopping. <laughs> the so best. Who, would, who would he be in the show? Oh, like, oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> Higgins. Higgins. Oh, Higgins. <laughs> I would take Roy Kent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course I mean, you would. Yeah. Of course I mean, you would. Of course you would. So, Dr. Coomer, do you want to go see Roy Cat with us later in April? <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Why not? Yeah. Absolutely. We've got it on the calendar. <laughs> we do. We do. Hang tight for one second. Um, I just want to let our audience know you can ask questions. Use the chat on YouTube or Facebook. Tweet us or email the Medical News Network. Info is there on your screen. Let's get a quick check on our COVID count. Dr. Dana Hawkinson, good morning. Hi, how are Hi. you? Good. Yeah, the COVID count's been lower, um, you know, than it than it had been previously, 23 active patients, just a couple in the ICU. So overall, those trends are looking good, as are the amount of people who are going to the emergency department, primary care offices, and urgent care because of influenza-like illness, which includes COVID-19, influenza, and even other coughs and colds. So overall, hopefully the circulation uh, continues to decrease as we get in, uh, get in through February and hopefully into the spring. All right, Hotness CDC just released new data on the latest COVID vaccine. Their study found that the shot gave 54% increased protection against symptomatic infection. Mm -hmm. So explain what that statistic means. Yeah, I think this is good. Again, remember, we are giving vaccines not really to prevent infection. The vaccines are meant to protect against disease and especially severe disease. And that really goes for all of the vaccines that we give. Unfortunately, there was um, some miscommunication early on because one of the partial benefits of the uh, COVID vaccines in particular is that they initially did help stop infection. They still do have a little bit of that beneficial effect as well. And what this study showed is that from the new updated COVID vaccine, which was rolled out in the fall, um, these are early estimates about recent variants and including the JN1 variant, which is the most predominant variant at this point. What they found that was those people that did receive uh, the new updated vaccine, they actually had uh, over 50% less chance of having symptomatic infection. So this is good news. You know, we are still going to wait for the final uh, uh, vaccine efficacy estimates on protection against severe disease and hospitalization. But this is even better news. This is, again, one more beneficial effect um, from the vaccine of providing protection, not just against severe disease uh, and hospitalization, but also even against symptomatic infection. All right, Hawk, thank you so much. Yeah. Let's get to a couple quick questions from our viewers this morning. Uh, Kate wants to know, Dr. Coomer, um, how often does a recipient's body reject the new kidney? Well, it's a, it's a constant balance, right? So the, this is a foreign object in, in the recipient, and it does occur. And, um, you know, at some point during the life of the kidney, there's going to be always going to be some rejection, whether it's chronic or acute. So it, it's something we always have to fight with, with medication. Uh, but I would say probably a great majority have some subacute rejection at some point. What was the worst part of the preparation for this? Um, I don't know that there really was like a worst part. Maybe maybe like going through the testing for two days. Just was that grueling? No, I, I wouldn't say it's grueling. It was just intense. Just you know, lots of things back to back to back. One and, day. But <laughs> it's a long couple of days. Yeah. yeah. 
but not uh, not not terrible. And I, and I know you got to go. Last question from Brenda. Do do you recommend calcium supplements? She's hearing that they can cause buildup in the kidneys. Do you know the answer to that? Those are tough ones to. I mean, <laughs> certainly having normal recommended daily allowance of calcium is appropriate, but. Uh, you know, some people have some um, disorders and diseases that, that cause problems with calcium, so it, it, it's a hard question yeah. to, to okay. answer, really. Okay. Um, well, I want to get our takeaways today. Great conversation. Gina, what do you want folks to take away from this story? Um, I think if you have any, like, tug in your heart, <laughs> um, any feeling that you should see if you can be a match for someone, just go for it. Make the call. You only need one. Only do one, so. and, your, and she gave you the, the gift of the kidney back, your Tiffany kidney, right? Yes. Okay, so what is the takeaway from your story, Courtney? Um, what I really want people to understand is if they are in this position where they're looking at needing a kidney, the best thing you can do is be your own advocate, um, at, share your story, share your challenges, share your wins, um, and be human so that you can share this message because we're we're not alone. You said a hundred thousand people are waiting for a kidney, and go for it. Start your own campaign. Make those calls. Share those messages. And like Ted Lasso, we can bring this message forward together. And as a team, we can do anything. Sorry to make you follow that, but what is your <laughs> final thought and takeaway today? Well, I mean, donors are the heroes, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there, there's two ways to look at it. First is deceased donation. Sign up to be a deceased donor. Um, as you leave uh, this life or, or your, your um, family members do, please consider donation. A deceased donation makes a large uh, dent in that, that number. And uh, living donation is also a great way to help people. So please consider donation any in every way you can. I, we talk about living, but yeah, thank you for the message about deceased because there's two ways to help for sure. All right, thank, thank you to all of you. I appreciate you, you being here. Thanks to all of our viewers as well. Make it a great day. We'll see you back here on Monday. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update. Head and neck cancers are on the rise, and doctors often know it's there even if they can't see a tumor. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update, how oncologists decide between starting treatment or searching for the cancer source, Monday at 8. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.